the council. Oh, now, okay. All right, welcome everybody. My name is Tony Wayne. I'm very happy to welcome you to a Public Diplomacy Council of America event, a very special event where we are going to recognize outstanding service in public diplomacy, outstanding performance by a public diplomacy senior officer. This is the first year that we have given out a, a recognition for a senior officer, PDCA, as the Public, as public Diplomacy Council of America is known, has been recognizing outstanding performance by public diplomacy employees at home and abroad since 1992 in one form or another. But until this last year, we did not have a, a particular recognition for outstanding performance by a senior officer overseas or in Washington. We created this new award and we're very happy that uh, Ambassador Bernadette Meehan is going, is one of the, the two recipients this year. We picked an overseas uh, representative and a Washington DC based representative that really embody the, the kind of outstanding work on public diplomacy that we believe is needed today uh, by the United States to really get its messages across and have uh, sufficient and good influence in, with other publics around the world. So Ambassador Mian and her team faced a year uh, of a combination of, of anniversaries that held both a lot of promise and some challenges. Anniversaries of the uh, establishment of US relations with Chile, also of the, uh, the free trade agreement between Chile and the United States on the positive side, and then on the negative side of the dictatorship of uh, General Pinochet. And so they, they developed a program and a strategy with a series of using public diplomacy tools in creative ways uh, to both take advantage of those opportunities and to avoid the pitfalls and turn the potential pitfalls into positives for US-Chilean relations. And they did an outstanding job of this led by the ambassador. And so uh, this is a great opportunity to learn about what they did, share those excellent practices. And I'm going to, I think, first turn this over for, for a video and then we'll hear from the ambassador. Thank you very much. es el futuro. Si las niñas lideran el camino, el futuro podría ser mucho mejor. Good afternoon from wintry Santiago. I am so excited to be with you today for this first Monday Forum. Thank you to the Public Diplomacy Council of America for honoring me and Embassy Santiago with the 2024 Award for Public Diplomacy Leadership by a Senior Officer. PDC PDCA's leadership in support of the practice of public diplomacy and academic study and your advocacy throughout the world is vital to all that we do. Public diplomacy is a team effort and organizations and forums like this make us all better practitioners. This award really belongs to every agency and section within Embassy Santiago and today I am proud to share with you our public diplomacy story. As chief of mission, I get the credit, but I am only one small part of an outstanding team that I am privileged to lead. And of course, our team on the ground is supported by an entire ecosystem in Washington. I am a firm believer that interactive conversations are more interesting than lectures, so I will endeavor to be brief, and we have some photos and videos embedded uh, to, help, to help illustrate uh, my words. I will provide some context about the U.S.-Chile relationship, offer some examples of Embassy Santiago's public diplomacy strategy, and share some lessons learned. To set the stage, when I first arrived in Chile in September 2022, our bilateral relationship was strained. 
Four years had passed without a U.S. ambassador, and a new left-wing government that was skeptical of the United States had recently come to power. In 2023, our bilateral relationship had two major milestones, the bicentennial of U.S.-Chile relations and 50 years since a military coup overthrew Chile's democratically elected president. With only three and a half months from my arrival until the start of the year, there was a lot for our team to sort out together. We decided to start by introducing me to the people of Chile. Of course, I did all of the formal, official diplomatic meetings and protocols, but we wanted to develop a strategy for me to communicate directly with the public. We strove to establish a personal brand for me of a serious, smart, experienced diplomat, but accessible and down to earth. Our communications were designed to clearly explain our policy priorities, while also demonstrating my genuine personal interest in Chile, its people, and its culture. Our postings were interactive, encouraging people to engage with me directly and create a dialogue. Thanks to the incredible work of our PD team, I became a recognized entity throughout Chile, and our messaging gained hundreds of thousands of views and engagements. When our social media postings went viral, the traditional media would cover them as news, providing us with a wealth of earned media. In stark contrast, I might add, to the drab, sternly worded content that the PRC was paying to publish. We alternated between serious policy messaging and cultural and personal interludes, including my young family. We integrated strategic traditional media engagements, including press conferences and interviews. Once we introduced myself, we turned to building a year-long mission-wide campaign to help achieve our policy goals. The bicentennial of our relations offered a clear and definitive marker of a long-standing relationship. We centered our campaign around a slogan, Partners for a Better Future, Socios para un Futuro Mejor. We designed an accompanying logo by launching a contest won by a young Chilean artist who incorporated the shared red, white, and blue colors of our flags and our national birds, the eagle and the condor. Part of our goal was to create a campaign that didn't rely on one person since ambassadors come and go, and that would be flexible enough to remain relevant beyond the bicentennial year. We radiated this theme from every single aspect of our relationship, economic, political, security, military, academic, scientific, people to people, and more. Every single section and agency in Embassy Santiago embraced this branding and used it to thread our activities together, even if there was no other obvious connection. Everything we did as an embassy throughout the year was branded with the logo. And when I say everything, I mean everything. We hung an enormous banner from the embassy's exterior wall. We branded stationery, menus, challenge coins, videos, email signatures, swag, donations, anything you can think of, we put this logo and the slogan on it. We also asked partners like AmCham to use the logo to act as force multipliers. The logo and slogan became so ubiquitous that the government of Chile adopted the slogan for use at bilateral events and polling indicated that a remarkable 34% of Chileans were aware that 2023 was the 200 year anniversary of US-Chile relations. I'm not even sure that 34% of the State Department's Western Hemisphere Bureau knew that. So the fact that 34% of this country knew it was really a testament to the work that this team did. We raised private sector funding for bicentennial activities throughout the year, including stands at concerts like Lollapalooza, education conferences, activities at American Corners, and a massive Independence Day celebration. We co-hosted events with the government of Chile. We ensured that every U.S. government official working on Chile had the anniversary at the top of their talking points. President Biden, Secretary Blinken, Secretary Yellen, and others referenced the bicentennial in their meetings with Chilean counterparts and all of their public comments. Celebrations of the bicentennial were so popular in Chile that by June, when the American Chamber of Commerce hosted an anniversary gala in honor of the 20th anniversary of our bilateral free trade agreement, the president of Chile, Gabriel Boric, spoke at the event, even though he had entered his presidency less than two years earlier, vowing to revisit FTAs, and he was a known skeptic of the United States and our role in the region. While the bicentennial presented a positive opportunity, the 50th anniversary of the coup the same year was a significant challenge. We knew that any engagement entailed a great deal of risk for the United States, 
for the embassy and for me, the ambassador, as the messenger. The September 11th, 1973 coup led to the death of democratically elected President Salvador Allende and ushered in a 17-year dictatorship led by General Augusto Pinochet. This regime was known for assassinations, tortures, and disappearances. On September 21st, 1976, agents working for Pinochet planted a car bomb that exploded in Washington, D.C.'s Sheridan Circle, killing Orlando Letelier, a leading Chilean opposition figure in exile, and his 25-year-old American assistant, Ronnie Moffat. It was a state-sponsored assassination in the heart of the United States. While in the United States, 50 years seems like a long time, in Chile, the remnants of this action seemed like they took place yesterday. 50 years later, in 2023, there was lasting bitterness over the destabilizing role the United States had played in Chile for years leading up to the coup, a widespread belief that the United States participated in the coup itself, and anger over the United States' long support for Pinochet. In 2023, the government of Chile announced a plan de búsqueda, an official search for the remains of more than 1,000 people still missing from the dictatorship era, including one American citizen who has never been found. The initial inclination among many in Washington was for us to steer clear of a subject that did not show the United States in a positive light. Skeptics believed that our engagement would raise unpleasant questions about the U.S. commitment to democracy and human rights. But I and the embassy team strongly believed that we needed to proactively engage if we wanted to retain any credibility and influence in Chile, particularly with the current government. Also, it was the right thing to do. Transparency was paramount, and we worked closely with Washington stakeholders on the declassification and publication of key U.S. documents related to the coup, including the presidential daily brief from the day of the coup, which had remained classified for 50 years. We initiated a grant to translate these documents into Spanish and make widely available an additional 23,000 previously declassified documents related to that period of time, to make more information accessible to the Chilean public and to allow Chileans to make their own decisions about the role of the United States during that period of time. We convinced the White House to send a delegation to the official commemoration events and release a public statement marking the 50th anniversary of the coup. But we also decided to lift up a less prominent milestone taking place in 2023. After all of the focus on the dark activities of the United States, we wanted to pivot back Back to the light. The 35th anniversary of the 1988 plebiscite in which Chileans voted to return to democracy. Then U.S. Ambassador Harry G. Barnes Jr. led a change in U.S. policy in favor of democratic elections and human rights. He pushed back against Pinochet and he is a revered figure in Chile for the risks that he took to support Chileans who were fighting peacefully to return to democracy. But we realized that his actions and the role of the United States in helping Chile transition back to democracy were being forgotten with the passage of time. We lobbied the Department of State to officially name the Chief of Mission Residence Barnes House. On the October anniversary of the plebiscite, our mission-wide team gathered Chileans and U.S. citizens who flew down to Chile, some of them for the first time in 35 years, to celebrate the naming and pay tribute to the Chileans who resisted the dictatorship democracy activists, government representatives, academic, business, and civil society leaders joined Ambassador Barnes's 98-year-old widow who flew down from Vermont and two of his daughters for a poignant ceremony at the Barnes house. We partnered with a local production company, La Ventana Chile, to create a documentary, an oral history about Ambassador Barnes's role, which you will see a clip of in a few minutes. So even though Ambassador Barnes had passed away 12 years earlier, his spirit now lives on. The international press coverage of US government actions around the anniversaries of the coup and the plebiscite was widespread and laudatory. The overall takeaway was that after 50 years, the United States was living up to its values and that the United States and Chile had overcome the darkest of histories to emerge as partners. For the first time since 1973, we were able to move past this dark period of our shared history into a new era of our relationship, again embracing the bicentennial theme, partners for a better future. As we look to that future, the practice of public diplomacy is more vital than ever. 
In closing, as you see how we've adopted the logo to live beyond the 200 years, I wanted to offer 10 very quick best practices and lessons learned from Embassy Santiago's public diplomacy strategy during this challenging year. First, policy is not effective if you can't explain it and convince people of its value. Public diplomacy must be integrated with policy development. Public diplomacy is not an add-on at the end of a process to implement decisions that are already made. The teams need to work in tandem throughout the process. Create a recognizable campaign to link disparate efforts together under one message, brand, and visual. You'll get so much more mileage out of it. Leverage existing milestones and events to advance objectives. These events were going to take place with or without a US voice as part of it. So why not take advantage and proactively shape the message we want people to receive? You really must know your audience to message effectively to them and know what tools will resonate with them. You must have the same core message, but there are infinite ways to convey that message to your different audience segments. Create an ecosystem of influencers to expand your audience and build credibility with new communities. Bring new people into the tent. Break the mold, be bold, be innovative. But at the same time, don't reinvent the wheel when you don't have to. Stay true to your values. Push Washington to do more. If you ask, you may just get it. We had a period of time earlier this year in 2024 where we requested two personal statements from President Biden and we got them in the same week because we asked. Be authentic. Remember that we are people as diplomats. We're not robots. People want to feel that human connection as they're seeking to understand the relationship. And with that, I will close my remarks by thanking the really incredible Embassy Santiago team and by noting that above all, the best I can give practitioners of public diplomacy in the field is to rely on your locally engaged staff. Our colleagues in the field are not just the institutional memory, they are the experts. They are the people that can guide us in ways that we will never be able to do for ourselves. And too often they are the unsung heroes behind the work that the officers are doing. Thank you again to the Public Diplomacy Council of America for this recognition. It is a reminder of the importance of public diplomacy in building a better world, one conversation at a time. Now, I have the immense pleasure of introducing two of our incredible Chilean partners. Jota Loyola Croveto is a Chilean journalist, director, editor, and screenwriter known for his work in nonfiction audiovisual projects. Most relevant to this discussion is that Jota directed the documentary project about Ambassador Barnes. We are now going to show you a four minute brief clip of the beautiful emotional film that he made about the darkest times in the US-Chile relations and the shift in policy that restored the credibility and the faith that Chileans had in the United States. The eight minute version of this film was shown during the Barnes House naming ceremony and subsequently was made available to the public. Joto will then share his experiences and perspectives on the US-Chile relationship, its evolution through the bicentennial year and his collaboration with the embassy on the Barnes documentary. We will then hear from another Chilean collaborator, Javiera Diaz, a 21 year old political science student at Universidad Católica de Chile a spokesperson for the non-governmental organization Tremendas. She empowers girls and young women to address social issues, promote climate awareness, advance in STEM fields, improve health and well-being, foster inclusivity, and encourage artistic and cultural expression. Javiera is an alumna of the 2024 SUSI Student Leaders Program and will talk about the importance of international exchanges and other US people-to-people -people initiatives. She's collaborated extensively with our network of American spaces in several areas, most recently focused on gender equality. Jota and Javiera, welcome and thank you for being here. Over to you. a 12 años del golpe de Estado en Chile. Se declarará en estado de sitio a todo parte del territorio nacional. El pueblo pide libertad a los prisioneros políticos. El modelo Pinochet tenía un enorme desprestigio a nivel internacional, con enormes y masivas protestas ciudadanas, con saldos altísimos de muertos. El 
El embajador Harry Barnes aterrizó en Chile el 18 de noviembre de 1985. Barnes, a su llegada, fue recibido en el aeropuerto por funcionarios de la Cancillería. Era imponente, con esa cara de, de boxeador, pero muy sensible. No creo que me vaya a sentir como un extraño en vuestro país. Llega a Chile con un mandato de impulsar un proceso de transición democrática. El primer puesto como embajador de Barnes lo obtienen en la Rumania comunista de Nicolás Chechesco. Eso permite su conocimiento del autoritarismo. Todos dijimos mucho embajador para un país tan chiquito, algo va a pasar. En la presentación de sus cartas credenciales enfrentó a Augusto Pinochet, advirtiéndole que los males de la democracia solo pueden curarse con más democracia. Pinochet le pega en buen chileno un huascazo al embajador diciendo lo siguiente, nosotros no somos ni colonia, ni esclavos. And my father rarely ever got to meet him again. Hay una caricatura que él tenía colgada en su oficina donde aparece la moneda y él tocando la puerta y dice cerrado, no insista. Un diplomático bueno actúa de dos maneras, cumpliendo instrucciones o tomando iniciativas e interpretando las instrucciones. Y esto es lo que hizo muy bien Harold Barnes. Me impresionó de inmediato como un diplomático con mucha fuerza, sin tentación de neutralidad permanente. Harry Barnes empezó a apoyar la movilización pacífica en contra de la dictadura. 1986, comuna de Estación Central, Santiago. Rodrigo Rojas de Neiri, que había vivido 10 años en Estados Unidos, vuelve a Chile, era reportero gráfico. Y sale con Carmen Gloria Quintana a cubrir y los intercepta una patrulla del ejército. Los detienen y de repente los rocean con gasolina y le prenden fuego. Harry Barnes tuvo el coraje de acudir al funeral de Rodrigo Rojas de Negro. El hecho de que estuviera presente el embajador de Estados Unidos era... Fuerza para nuestra pelea. The carabineros came and dispersed the, the crowds and, and used tear gas. Entonces dijimos, embajador, ahora hay que arrancar, hay que, tenemos que salir del lugar. Y ahí salimos con máscara porque ya no se podía respirar. This important event was coming up, the plebiscite in October of 1988. Uh, the Congress approved a special $1 million appropriation for the net to support a democratic transition uh, through this plebiscite. Harry built trust between himself and the country's democratic forces. Hi, thank you very much. I want to share these words with all of you. It is a privilege for me to be here today. My name is Jota Loyola, a Chilean journalist and documentary filmmaker. At the request of Ambassador Mihan and the US Embassy in Chile, I was entrusted with directing a short documentary about Ambassador Harry Barnes. The embassy was preparing for an unprecedented milestone, renaming the ambassador residence in Chile to Barnes House in his honor. Harry Barnes arrived in Chile in 1985 on a crucial diplomatic mission to accelerate the end of Pinochet dictatorship and restore democracy. That same year I was born, never imagining that 30 some years later, I would have the opportunity of investigating events of such significance. The efforts of Ambassador Barnes, along with the courageous action of many Chileans, helped pave the way for the 1988 plebiscite, which ended the Pinochet regime and began Chile's return to democracy. 
While making this documentary, I discovered the profound conviction in the values of democracy and human rights, contrasting with the stories I heard in my childhood about the U.S. support for dictatorial regimes in Latin America. This story demonstrates once again that high diplomacy is more effective than war in resolving conflict. Ambassador Mihan had the vision to highlight this message as she herself practices it. Today, as we begin the third century of our bilateral relationship, a new perspective emerged on the role of the United States in Latin America and the world as a steadfast defender of democratic values. The Operation Barnes, told in detail for the first time, I love to extend into a future length documentary. His diplomatic career perfectly illustrates the world of those days. During the Cold War, he understood the complexities of engaging with the Soviet Union, played a crucial role in diplomatic relations with Romania during Ceausescu, and later traveled to India amidst the Soviet Union invasion of Afghanistan. His final diplomatic mission was in Chile, where he crowned his career with perhaps his greatest success. Thank you, Ambassador Mihan, for your effort in illuminating democracy, especially today, where it is threatened in many parts of the world. In recent days, we have witnessed the difficulty of ending a dictatorship through democratic means, which further honors the legacy of Barnes. Ambassador Mihan, you and Barnes share skills reserved for only a few, establishing connections, shaking hands, and creating agreement, agreements that allow peaceful understanding among peoples. Thank you very much. Three, two, one. Um, good morning, everyone, ambassador, people that work at the embassy, diplomats and students. Uh, I am Javier Diaz. I am a student uh, of political science. Uh, I'm an activist for gender equality and for the representation of girls and young women and an alumna of the SUSI for Students Leaders uh, program 2024. Today, I have the honor to talk to all of you about my relationship with the embassy and how it has impacted my life. And to, ask, to start by asking you, what do you picture when I ask you to visualize the ambassador of the US in Chile? If you would have asked me a few years ago, or if you asked my parents, or if you asked someone in the street, probably the first thing that comes to mind is a serious man that goes to really fancy places uh, and is focused on the relationship with other really fancy and important people and diplomats. But now my view has definitely changed. Ambassador Mihan and my relationship with the embassy here in Santiago has allowed me to understand that uh, an ambassador is someone that creates relationships with the people. 
uh, someone that goes to the schools uh, to, to that goes to every little corner of, of our long and diverse country and that is uh, generally concerned about the problematics of the people that she represents and of the people of Chile. For me, as a young leader and a woman, uh, it's an honor to have such a wonderful ambassador uh, to feel represented in a leader like that, something that doesn't happen that often. People to people initiatives and the vision of the embassy is for sure something that can impact enormously the Chilean society. The dialogue and the cultural exchange that, uh, that it allows is crucial for the challenges of the present and of the future, something that as a young leader, I am really concerned about and really thankful that the embassy allows this opportunity. Not only that, but exchange programs like the SUSI program that I was a part of this past summer, uh, is, I am so lucky to be a part of instances like that because it, it strengthens my leadership that many times we don't know we have or that we're not using to its full potential. Uh, now I can contribute to my country in ways that before I couldn't, using the cultural exchange and the knowledge those six weeks gave me. I was even, uh, I also had the opportunity, for example, uh, to be granted a mini grant. And now, which I, which I used to fund a program here in Chile that gives young girls the skills and political empowerment, they need to be the leaders of the future. That's how much these kinds of programs can impact because I was not only myself, the person that was impacted by this initiative, but also my community and the girls that uh, were privileged to be in this program that uh, I created. I now look forward to returning to the U.S. and continue to learn from these institutions, something that wasn't part of my plans before. Opportunities like that can open a whole new world to a young woman like me, and I'm sure it will open to many more. We can create a society that cares about people and their dreams. The future holds so much, and I'm sure diplomacy will be up to the challenge. But we can do it by making more inclusive and comprehensive institutions, for example, the Embassy of here in Santiago. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Javiera. All right, that was excellent. It was a great introduction to all that you and your team did. And it was very nice to have those two personalized views of some of those important activities. I uh, had the pleasure of meeting Harry Barnes a few times and was a very good friend of one of his daughters and his uh, son-in-law. So wow. I was so happy to see you recognize his outstanding work in support of democracy in Chile in very difficult situation. Um, we Thank will you. be joined in a few minutes by a, a colleague from the Under Secretary of uh, Public Affairs Public Diplomacy's office. But until we do that, let's explore a little bit <laughs> some of your activities and we'll invite questions, please, from the audience. Please submit some questions. But I'll start off just saying, um, so can you say a little bit about how you use different kinds of media to reach out to people, different forms of social media, different forms of traditional media, how you mix that together, what strategies you came up with to making sure you were reaching the right audiences? Sure. Uh, it's a great question. And here is where primarily we rely on our local staff colleagues. Uh, we have an incredible team here, uh, led by two Vero's, in fact, uh, when we talk about media, uh, Ceci Peña Fiel, others, uh, who really were able to segment for us and create a bitmap, if you will, uh, of who our audience is, who we're trying to reach, and what are uh, the tools that people use to receive their, their news. Uh, you have traditional uh, people who read the paper newspapers, you have folks who look at cable news, broadcast news, and you have increasingly with young people uh, a wide range of social media tools at your disposal. Um, we wanted to make sure that we got the balance right. Um, we felt that by overweighting in social media, you know, we wouldn't be seen as uh, as serious. But if you spend too much time engaging only with traditional media, you lose that ability to really communicate directly with the audience, uh, be spontaneous, and have a little bit of fun and be interactive. Um, so depending on the issue, we took various different approaches and we integrated them all. Um, you heard me mention in the presentation that one of the most wonderful things that we found is if you can create a viral moment in social media, traditional media doesn't want to be left out of what's going on in the conversation. So you have 
infinite amount of earned media, right, for free, which is which is really amazing. Um, and so we learned ways to use that echo chamber to our advantage. Um, but the thing that we love the most about it is it allows us to have an interactive engagement. So oftentimes, for example, when I'm traveling to a different region of Chile, I'll film a video before I go, ask for recommendations on restaurants or cultural sites that I should see. That gets people excited uh, about my visit in advance. I see people on the streets who ask for selfies, who throw recommendations, you know, they shout them out at me as I'm walking down the street. Um, and that builds up uh, a sense that people know me um, and it builds up a sense that they can trust me, uh, that I, I'm a, a, a messenger of confidence. Um, and then when we have to actually go to the traditional media uh, or in other forums to lay down difficult messages sometimes uh, or policy explanations, there's that reservoir of goodwill that I already have stored up to build on. Yeah, that's great. And you're exactly right. There are different audiences that that get their information with different media, as we have in the United States. Mm -hmm. I'm sure in Chile, and it's probably a little bit different in, you know, maybe in Brazil or France. And you just have to look at each country where you're there. And that sounds wonderful how you did that. Um, Absolutely. We have a question from the audience asking if there was ever a proposed message that you sent out it. it got lost in translation or didn't really come through. And then if you've revisited that and reformulated your message, sort of learning you know, as you go. Yeah, that's a great question. And I will say no, again, not because of me, uh, but because I have come to rely on and all of the members of this mission have come to rely on our local staff. Um, and our local staff are the ones that know the culture, the institutional uh, nature of this relationship, what will resonate, what will fall flat. Um, and so I'm someone who has a very type A personality. I do a lot of prep work before I engage. Uh, so, you know, having that trust with my staff and relying on them uh, and having them know that they should say to me, hey, the good idea fairy is wonderful, but maybe this one should should take a nap for a while, that's not gonna resonate here or that's gonna fall flat, um, is a relationship that I have with the team that I value because they steer me away um, for, from some of those danger areas that otherwise, you know, what I think might be a great idea, they're like, look, ma'am, that sounds great, but it's just not gonna fly here in Chile. Mm -hmm. Now, we, another question points out that as you said, and in all of our embassies, we have a lot of different agencies there, right? They're not all the public diplomacy section, and they're not all yes. trained in public diplomacy. And I remember this very much, having a lot of law enforcement in Mexico and mm -hmm. also having more technical agencies. And it was mm -hmm. sometimes hard to get them going. But when you did and you could get them involved, they could make a difference. I remember Absolutely. discovering that we uh, had a fruit fly control program in Mexico involving hundreds and hundreds of thousands of fruit, sterile fruit flies. And once we put that out, it was really popular, but the, <laughs> the people never wanted to put it out because they thought, oh, no one's going to be interested in this work. Well, they were. Have you, have you, do you have some similar challenges and opportunities like that? Absolutely. And in fact, on the topic, uh, not necessarily of fruit flies, but of fruit, uh, we had a major breakthrough this year when after 24 years of negotiations, the United States and Chile have come to agreement on a systems approach inspection for table grapes. Uh, Chile exports almost half a billion dollars worth of table grapes to the United States every year. This agreement will allow them to do so without fumigation, which drives down costs, increases competitiveness for Chilean exports in the U.S. market. Uh, but it took us almost a quarter century to get here. Now, when I would first start talking about this with people, they would say, Ooh, what is the ambassador talking about? Who really cares about table grape exports? What is the systems approach? But I feel confident that we, if we were to do a poll in Chile now, uh, you would have pretty high numbers of people that understand what the systems approach is, why it's important to the United States, why it's important to Chile, uh, and they'd be able to have some fun with it um, because our media team here has been so creative in creating some of those viral moments, those interactive moments that blend sort of the difficulty of the negotiations and some of the hard positions that we had to take when negotiating this arrangement with our Chilean partners uh, with some of the lighthearted moments that that um, that are produced from it. Uh, so I think it's all about finding that right combination of how you message and you can make any topic seem interesting and engaging. Uh, and a credit, we have several folks in the room with me here, Astrid, I have Mario, I have Hector. Uh, we have an incredible team here that knows how to design 
graphics, videos, interspersed photos, make presentations. So it's not sort of the old, dry, diplomatic speak uh, of, our, of our forebears, you might say. It's knowing how to connect with those audiences on topics that may be dry or confusing and making them exciting and relevant to today's audience. Yeah, very important points. And of course, that's what so many of younger generations are learning to do naturally. Yes. And we in the diplomatic service need to incorporate that going forward. Now, the related question we have here is, you get an integrated approach at the embassy. What do you have to worry about Washington? How do you work with Washington <laughs> in, in getting them to participate in this? And that involves the Department of State, but it also involves other agencies. So Absolutely. what experiences did you have in that area? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, this goes to the point of being bold and being innovative, but not reinventing the wheel when you don't have to. There is an entire repository uh, that lives in Washington as it collects ideas and, and experiences and back best practices from embassies around the world that we try to use. Look at the roadmap that exists. See if you can adjust it for your current situations in your current country. And if you can, then you can divert a little bit or you add uh, embellishments that make it more relevant to your context, but you don't start from scratch. Um, an amazing example has to do with the declassification of documents uh, from the 50th anniversary. I believe we have John Powers and some of our colleagues from records agencies, from the National Security Council and, and other parts of the, the interagency in Washington. You can imagine that the, the debate uh, that went into a decision to declassify a presidential daily brief, we declassified two of them actually, after more than 50 years, especially at a time when we knew the spotlight would be on anything that we were saying and doing. Uh, but this was an interagency process. We knew we would need a long uh, stretch of time to work through the issue, so we built that into the calendar. Uh, and what I think is really important is that the messengers and the public diplomacy practitioners were involved in those decisions, uh, not the decision as to whether you could declassify uh, information that resides with the experts, but all along the way, how we intended to use the information, what the message would be attached to it, how we were going to convey that to all of the different audiences that would have an interest, not just in Chile, but because of the significance of that anniversary, all around the world we knew, the New York Times, the Washington Post, NPR, so many folks would be looking at it. So the key was really making sure that the public diplomacy folks were engaged from the very beginning so we could convey with confidence and sort of reassure folks in Washington who may have been a little uneasy with, um, with the boldness of, of the actions that we were recommending. Uh, and so learning from past experiences in Argentina, in Guatemala, and other countries uh, where the agency had, had done this before, the interagency, was key to being able to do it in a way that um, gave um, confidence to folks in Washington, while at the same time allowed us to do it in a way that was relevant specifically to the audience in Chile. That's great. Could you say a little bit about how you dealt with some of the skepticism that you probably ran into in uh, in Mexico? We used to say we had various circles of skepticism, and yes. especially about the United States. We had another troubled relationship historically. So how did you confront skepticism when it came up and you were starting to try to change people's views? Yes, it's a great question. Uh, again, we laid out um, a timeline. Uh, this was not something where a week before the 50th anniversary of the coup, we pulled together a meeting and said, hey, this anniversary is coming up in seven days. We should probably do something. Uh, for more than a year, we'd been working with colleagues in Washington on the declassification of documents. Uh, we identified through records research um, the fact that by, by circumstance, it was also the 35th anniversary of the plebiscite to return Chile to democracy. And I learned about Ambassador Barnes. Uh, and so we threaded the needle and said, how do we take something uh, where we know we have to be transparent? We can't try and sugarcoat the actions of the United States during this very dark chapter in our history 50 years ago, but we should look for a launching off point to be able to pivot from acknowledgement and transparency to how did we get to where we are 50 years later, which is a relationship that is one of the strongest in the hemisphere with shared values, particularly on the importance of democracy and support for human rights. And Harry Barnes and the actions that he took were the key link 
in making that possible. So for over a year, anywhere that I traveled in Chile, whether I met with ordinary people on the street, government ministers, uh, students, I would ask them questions uh, using a tone of respect to say, we understand that this anniversary is coming up, that most of Chile is focused on it. What do you see? as the appropriate role of the United States. And as you would imagine, you get an entire range of responses, uh, some of which make sense for our interests, some of which don't. Uh, but we were able to go out there and make it known to people that this was something that we really cared a lot about, that I personally cared a lot about. And we were going about these decisions with a lot of care and a lot of respect. And I think that built up um, a well of confidence and trust where even if people didn't necessarily agree with our message or didn't think we went far enough, they respected that we were taking the time to understand the history, be as transparent as we could be, and pivot uh, to the positive natures of the relationship as it exists in 2023 in that case. That's great, that's great. So you, you have a number of different exchange programs. Yes. And exchange programs are often aimed at the long run, but yes. you can try and help have them be useful in the short run. So you've got from the, the well-known Fulbright program to SUSE, which we heard about, and a number of others too. So could you say a little bit about how you use some of these different tools and programs to carry forward some of your messages as well as the traditional messages of exchange programs? Sure. I think there's a bit of a misnomer uh, sometimes in the world that U.S. exchange programs are focused on only soft power. Uh, I think back to the days where jazz diplomacy uh, many, many decades ago was sort of something very prominent and, and led the way when we think about cultural diplomacy and engagement um, on the non media or press side. But what we've done here at the embassy that we're really proud of, and I know lots of embassies do the same, is making sure that we're linking our exchange programs to our strategic country goals. Uh, so when we say, here are the hard policy objectives that we're looking to achieve in Chile, we look to public diplomacy tools, including exchanges going both ways, to further advance those goals. Uh, so for example, um, security is an area where we spend a lot of time focusing with our Chilean partners. And this brings in some of those agencies that you were referring to before um, that don't necessarily engage in the art of public diplomacy, so to speak. The DEA, the FBI, the Department of Justice. Um, so our public diplomacy team sits down with them as they're mapping out their strategic priorities for the year, and we understand what our budget and resource priorities are, uh, and works to say, if we have three main country goals in our integrated country strategy, you know, our strategy document, how do we use exchanges to further advance those goals? Let's look for young rising uh, leaders in areas of security. Let's look for young rising leaders in areas uh, that are working combating climate change because environment uh, conservation is a very important goal for us here and a shared value with the government of Chile. So it's ensuring that we're using these programs uh, not just to advance cultural people to people understanding, but underpinning that um, to strategic goals in sort of the hard policy areas that we're focused on. And that's been a big success for us uh, here in Chile. That's excellent. Let me ask quickly two brief questions or two questions sure. you could answer briefly and then uh, I see our, our colleague from R has joined us here which is the undersecretary's office even though R doesn't really go with public diplomacy or public affairs that's where <laughs> we are at the State Department uh, disinformation did you run into any disinformation or misinformation uh, methods and then uh, secondly funding how did you you had a whole year of busy programs how did you go about finding funds? Because I'm sure yes. they weren't all in the PD budget for the embassy <laughs> no. to begin with. So disinformation no. so, and, and, and funding. Yeah, great questions. Uh, disinformation and misinformation uh, is a concern here in Chile, as I would argue it is in every single country around the world, including the United States. Uh, so it's something that we focus on, but again, embedded within all of the other things that we do. I feel like so much of public diplomacy, the key is you can't pull it out into um, into silos, right? Public diplomacy is at its most effective when it's embedded with policy, uh, with all of the communications, with all of the programs, with all of the policy objectives. Uh, the government of Chile undertook a project uh, that was focused on misinformation and disinformation, though primarily in the domestic context, not foreign uh, interference. And so we linked this uh, with a visit from then Undersecretary uh, of Public Diplomacy, Liz Allen. 
Um, and we had her come to Chile. This is an area where she was an incredibly effective messenger. Uh, they recognized that she had global heft and weight on this issue. Uh, and so this is where we reached out to Washington to say, look, this is something that underpins all of the work that we do here, but we don't have the expertise and the resources to focus on it in a full-time manner. Would you send down a senior official to help jumpstart the conversations we're having with the government of Chile? So the undersecretary came down. It was an incredibly productive visit, uh, and that provided sort of a, a spring pad for us to continue um, with those particular efforts. When it comes to resourcing, like every mission around the world, uh, we wish we had more, so we have to do more with less, which is an incredible challenge. Uh, so we had to get creative. Uh, we realized by pulling in our management colleagues um, that there are rules and regulations that allow you in a bicentennial year to raise funds from the private sector uh, to support your bicentennial activities. So we went to hundreds uh, of US companies and Chilean companies that have an active relationship uh, between the two countries and we said to them here's why it's in your interest that we promote the shared values and the progress that the United States and Chile have enjoyed together we made a compelling argument we raised several hundred thousand dollars which underpinned all of the activities that we carried out throughout the course of the year under the bicentennial slogan uh, and that allowed us to get the word out importantly outside of the capital we were able to do things all across um, the length of Chile, which was important because obviously you want to make sure you're reaching people that aren't just sitting uh, in the capital city. In other initiatives, like the naming of the Barnes House, uh, again, with the creative solutions offered by our management colleagues, we realize that there are pots of money in the Department of State that don't necessarily correspond directly to PD work. Um, but if you can be creative and truthful and transparent about explaining what your mission is, different pots of money suddenly become open to you. Uh, and so this is where I would encourage public diplomacy teams to make sure that they're incorporating areas of the embassy that you wouldn't necessarily think are the public diplomacy hive. Uh, because they have a wonderful way of, of feeding input into the process. And frankly, not just on money, on ideas, on what the key audiences that they're targeting are looking for, how they're consuming their information. Uh, one last example I'll give is that our DEA colleagues here have been focused on how they get out the word to young Chileans uh, that drugs are bad and are dangerous as the society here shifts and drugs become a, a larger problem. Uh, so our DEA helped to fund uh, and produce um, plays, actual works of theater uh, that the, the drug department of the local police services were putting on in high schools and grammar schools throughout Chile. So we put the Bicentennial logo on that. We partnered with them on that. I went out and spoke at those events because we knew that would attract press attention and local authorities and regional and national authorities. And that was one more way to link something that might seem like a disparate effort of the embassy under the same rubric of the bicentennial and the partners for a better future. So looking for all of those different opportunities and then weaving together with the common thread of the branding is a way that um, has worked for us. That's wonderful, Ambassador. Great insights. Thank you very much. So now I'm going to uh, invite to join us uh, with her screens, Stephanie Sutton. Stephanie is the Chief of Staff in the Office of the Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs, and she has uh, worked for a long time and from in different positions on these two issues also. So Stephanie, thank you for, for being with us. Thank you so much, Ambassador Wayne. It is my pleasure. It is so nice to see you again. Uh, so nice to see the PDCA community, Embassy Santiago. Hi, everybody. Fantastic work. Um, it's really my honor to join you today to celebrate U.S. Ambassador to Chile, Bernadette Mian, uh, for this incredibly well uh, well earned accomplishment. Uh, the PDCA's first ever award for diplomacy leadership by a senior official. Uh, thank you to PDCA for your advocacy uh, for PD. Um, at the State Department, we know that relationships between people are increasingly shaping our bilateral relationships. Um, that fact, coupled with the growing threat of foreign state information manipulation, the explosion of information spaces, means that the work of public diplomacy is urgent and critically important. Uh, we are deeply proud to have Ambassador Mian represent the United States in Chile. She is quite simply, as you've all heard and seen today, an amazingly talented leader who understands, lives, and evangelizes the policy importance of public diplomacy. I have been fortunate to call Ambassador Mian a colleague for the past almost 10 years. Um, first when she was at the National Security Council, uh, then at the Obama Foundation, and now as ambassador. For the past two years, she has graciously joined me during our annual Chief mm -hmm. Submission Conference to lead a discussion with her peers on building trust in the field through PD. 
through those conversations and by the example uh, to her holistic approach to public diplomacy that she set in the field, she's demonstrated a fundamental truth that public diplomacy is central to every foreign policy priority. And as you've heard, she has more than earned this award and recognition today. When Ambassador Mian arrived in Santiago in 2022, she was the first U.S. ambassador to Chile in four years. A new government had recently come to power, and other nations sought to deepen their own relationships with Chile. Ambassador Mian more than met that moment, reinvigorating our bilateral relationships through the practice of diplomacy, both private and public. A masterful communicator, she rapidly endeared herself to the Chilean public, firmly established her public policy expertise, and authentically shared her genuine interest in the country, its people, and its culture. Today, thanks to Ambassador Mann's public diplomacy vision and achievements and really centering her public diplomacy team in everything that they're doing at the mission, the U.S.-Chile relationship is strong, productive, and ready to enter its third century. In a recent press conference with Foreign Press, President Boric mentioned the positive U.S.-Chile relationship and cited Ambassador Mian by name. That kind of influence does not come about accidentally. In light of this, and in recognition of her PDCA award, I am delighted to join you in celebrating our United States Ambassador to Chile, my esteemed colleague and friend, Bernadette Mian. Bernadette, congratulations. It is such an honor to be here with you today. Uh, you are really the best, uh, just the best at all of this, and it's, it's an extraordinary thing to witness. Um, thank you. Thank you for having me. And Joel Fishman, over to you. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you for jumping in at the last moment to represent the Office of the State Department Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs. It's good to see you again. <clears throat> thank you, Ambassador Tony Wayne, for organizing and moderating today's program. Ambassador Wayne is co-chair of PDCA's Awards Committee, which with then co-chair J. Michael Korf selected Ambassador Mian as one of the first two recipients as others have already said, of the PDCA Award for Public Diplomacy Leadership by a, by a senior officer. Uh, PDCA is honored to have been able to do that. Thanks also to our tech host, PDCA Tuck Fellow, Gabby Stahl. Gabby is masterful at the careful online coordination that a program like this requires. And congratulations to our laureate, Ambassador Bernadette Mien, and uh, to the esteemed uh, Chileans who took part in today's program and to all in Embassy Santiago, including, and I love this term, the locally engaged staff. We have had a model demonstration today of how effective a well-planned, well-executed public diplomacy initiative can be with strong, well-rounded leadership and the full engagement of all embassy elements. We look forward to your future contributions to PDCA and, uh, and to the understanding and success of public diplomacy. We will have a change of pace for our September 1st Monday when we feature Alison Prash, Associate Professor of Rhetoric, Politics and Culture at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, an expert in US presidential rhetoric, political communication and the history of rhetoric Professor Prash's research and teaching seeks to understand how U.S. political leaders use words and action to create and sustain a particular vision of the United States to national and global audiences. This program is the first arranged by PDCA's new academic study committee, he headed by Karen Walker and Steve Pike. Professor Prash will discuss public diplomacy officers' role in requesting staging and promoting President's foreign travel, supported by her USIA archival research. Please note that this program will take place on September 9, the second Monday in September, due to the Labor Day holiday. It will be Zoom only. Professor Prash will be appearing from Madison, Wisconsin. Registration information will be available on the PDCA website and in the weekly update. You are also welcome to email me at president at publicdiplomacy.org. Glad all of you could be with us today. These programs are brought to you by the GWU Institute for Public Diplomacy and Global Communication, the USC Annenberg Center on Communication, Leadership and Policy, and the Public Diplomacy Council of America. Enjoy the rest of your summers. 
We look forward to seeing you on September 9. Goodbye for now. Thank you. Bye.